Good. Good. Let, let, me, let me start. Thank you. So I, I've been, this is, my name is Olivier Blanchard. I've been at the Peterson Institute only for uh, two and a half weeks, but I've already learned the uh, social norms, which is meetings uh, start on time. And so we start on time. Uh, Adam apologizes, but he's in Asia, and uh, he asked me to, uh, to run the meeting. Um, I understand, again, I've been here not very long, so I don't know what the traditions are, but I'm told that there's a tradition of having the, uh, the heads of uh, the various divisions at the fund come and share uh, their wisdom uh, with us. And we've met many of them uh, in the past. And today we are delighted to have uh, Rosé Vignals, who is going to talk about uh, the GFSR, but I think more generally how he sees the financial environment at this point. Uh, so welcome. Uh, I was given his uh, bio, but I kind of know the bio quite well. Uh, Jose and I go back to the late 70s uh, when uh, he was a student at uh, Harvard and uh, was kind enough to uh, take me as a thesis advisor. And uh, we have stayed in touch ever since. Uh, Jose went to, uh, first to Stanford for a number of years, I don't remember how many. Uh, but then decided, uh, heard the call of, uh, of the motherland, went back uh, to the Bank of Spain, where he uh, became eventually uh, deputy governor. Did many things there, but I remember the, the work he did in uh, creating in the institutional framework uh, for the euro, and we talked a lot about it uh, at the time. And then at some point, the uh, IMF had the good idea of asking him to come and uh, uh, head the uh, uh, capital markets uh, division. He came, and we've worked together for, I think, five years. I think you came well, about five years ago. Uh, and it has been uh, a nearly, uh, nearly a daily pleasure. I think he has made uh, an enormous difference to the place. I mean, this clearly the fact that uh, that we all became macro-financial uh, with the crisis gave him a, a, an important opening, but he used it. I think there's a much better integration of macro and financial issues at the fund now than there was when uh, either of us uh, came. So with this introduction, uh, I'm going to let Jose have the floor, and then I was told last night that we're supposed to have some smart remarks about the talk so I'll talk for a few minutes after, and then we'll take uh, questions. Jose? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Olivier, and uh, good afternoon to, to all of you. Um, l let me just say that one of the uh, uh, privileges that I've had at the uh, fund as financial counselor was to uh, uh, be at the same time as Olivier was there as economic counselor. And we have shared many, uh, many things in the fund. Um, and as I've mentioned in other occasions, I have never ceased to learn uh, from Olivier uh, during these uh, past few years. But here, I have come to talk about the global financial situation. And um, as you know, we had the meetings uh, in Lima uh, a couple of weeks ago. And in those meetings, uh, one of the key conversations has to do both with the world economic outlook and the global financial uh, uh, situation. And that is based on two presentations, which are typically made by the economic counselor and by myself as financial counselor. And what I'm going to do today is to use a variant of uh, what I use there uh, to talk about it. Um, and that leads to a conversation with the ministers of finance and the central bank governors, which then continues in all the more restricted sessions. So let me just move to the uh, roadmap. And the roadmap is one where the key message is that seven years after the peak of the global financial crisis, 
one has to recognize that in spite of tremendous improvement that has been made, global financial stability is not yet assured. And that should not be very surprising given that we had a tremendous financial crisis, which was the biggest in nearly 100 years. So I will start making the point that financial stability is not yet assured because while things are getting better in advanced economies from the stability point of view, risks are continuing to rotate towards emerging markets. And this is something which has been very much the focus of the meetings that we have had in Lima. Second point I want to make is that one needs to understand uh, everything that I will say in the context of the three global transitions that the uh, 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 world is um, having right now. First is the much needed China rebalancing from external to internal demand, from manufacturing to services, from investment to consumption, and which is key for the future health of China and of the world, given the key role that China plays. The second is the normalization of US uh, monetary conditions, something which is not only key for the US but also for everybody else. And last but certainly not least, the third transition is the unraveling of the commodity cycle if you want the end of the commodity super cycle, which is leading to a very significant worsening of the terms of trade of the countries which are commodity exporters. And I will have more to say about that. Now, as a result of the starting point on financial stability and of these three global transitions, I will talk about what are, in my view, the three most important challenges that policymakers are faced with at present, both regarding advanced economies, which need to deal with some remaining, important remaining legacies from the crisis, emerging markets, which need to address some of the emerging vulnerabilities, and third, some global issues having to do with some fragilities which are becoming increasingly evident in global financial markets. And I will end with some policy uh, discussions, basically making the point that uh, we need a collective effort to upgrade our policy frameworks so as to enhance confidence and to build resilience at a time where we're moving to a higher uh, uncertainty as a result of these transitions that I have talked about a moment ago. So let me move, oops, let me move now into uh, the first part, which is where are we regarding global financial stability. And I want to summarize the situation with the help of this slide, which basically looks on the left at the evolution of global risks. And this is a composite, uh, financial stability risks indicator that uh, we have used at the fund for a long time and which tells you that even if we are now better than we were uh, a couple of years ago and even better than we had at the time of Lehman, if I had prolonged this at the back, the, the, the numbers would be much higher in terms of the risk indicator. But the risks have been going up recently and what the right hand side tells you is why these global risks, global financial risks have been going up. As a result of a compositional change where advanced economies, risks to financial stability have been coming down uh, on the back of the broadened recovery and the significant and very strong actions that have been taken in advanced economies to clean up the financial system uh, uh, after the crisis. But emerging markets, which used to be the main source of support of the global economy uh, uh, during the crisis, uh, growth is now weakening. As you may have heard, we have downgraded uh, emerging markets uh, uh, growth forecast for the fifth year in a row. But also financial stability risks are increasing as a result of some of the vulnerabilities that I will talk about. So this exemplifies the rotation of risks from advanced economies to emerging markets in the field of financial, uh, financial stability. Now, as you can see, this rotation is not just new phenomenon. It has been happening for quite some time. What is new is that markets are starting to price in this 
rotation of risks to emerging markets in a much more evident way than in the past. And we just had an example of this during the summer when there were concerns about Chinese growth. First there was the stock market, then there was Chinese growth, then there was the change in the exchange rate re regime of China. All of this created uncertainty about where is China going, and that led to a significant uh, adjustment, uh, not only in stock market prices in China, but also commodity prices more generally, um, equity prices, particularly in emerging markets, but also uh, advanced economies were touched, and exchange rates in uh, emerging markets uh, depreciated very significantly, which also has a positive reading because that was part of the adjustment process to a very significant uh, shock coming from outside. So again, <laughs> these risks in emerging markets are beginning to uh, be priced in more, more evidently. Let me move now into the global policy challenges around this baseline where financial stability is not yet assured. And I will start by looking at the first of this trinity, I wouldn't say holy trinity, but this trinity of challenges that I have there. And I will start with advanced economies, legacies, and for that turn to the United States. Now, is there any legacy in the United States? Well, there is one evident legacy, which is the legacy of a zero uh, interest rates, a zero policy rates, and the Fed uh, needs to exit. We all know that, and the Fed had said, we're going to exit. But this is a process which is surrounded with uncertainty that needs to be well managed by the Fed. And I want to divide the uncertainty into two parts. Uncertainty about the first move by the Fed. This is getting a lot of attention. I think this is not that important from the macroeconomic point of view or macrofinancial point of view, but it's getting a lot of attention. When will the Fed move? And the Fed has been insisting that a hike and, and, and you know, hedging data dependent and so on, but basically suggesting that, you know, it's highly likely that the uh, interest rate, that policy interest rate will be increased still this year. Well, does the market uh, share that view? Uh, as you can see, these are the cumulative probabilities, uh, market uh, implied probabilities of a first hike by the Fed. And as you can see, um, this year, the probability is less than uh, 30% and only between March and uh, uh, June of next year is the first move really uh, more, uh, you know, significantly priced in. So again, there is a difference between what the Fed is signaling and what the markets are um, uh, thinking. But more important than when the process starts is uh, how the process is going to develop. What is the path of policy rate adjustments? And again, let's look at market uh, uh, implied probabilities of where the policy rate would be towards the end of 2017. And what one can say is that while the uh, uh, median or, or the, uh, the mode would be around uh, 2 to 2.5%, the probability distribution is quite significant. And there is a non-negligible probability of nearly 30% that the policy rate will not be more than 1% and could be lower by the end of 2017. So this is something, again, that tells you the uncertainty surrounding the normalization process of U.S. monetary policy, which also reflects some of the underlying uncertainties regarding uh, price developments and wage developments uh, in the United States. Now, how about Europe, continuing with advanced economies? Well. Europe, there are some good news. As you know, Europe has been the focus of the discussions in the spring and annual meetings at the Fund for quite some time. Uh, Europe has been not the issue uh, in, this, uh, in these meetings. In fact, if anything, there are some uh, uh, good news coming from Europe. And I want to mention the key legacy of Europe, which has to do, or one of the key legacies, which has the fact that the, the damaged positions of the private sector and of banks in the past have uh, led to a very significant deleveraging process, to a very significant credit contraction. And this is something which is now improving, very much helped by the uh, policies undertaken at the European level, uh, including uh, monetary policy, the courageous quantitative easing that the European Central Bank is pursuing. 
One can see that uh, credit is recovering, particularly in the corporate sector, which is where it, it fell the most, although still there are a number of countries in the periphery which uh, have still negative uh, growth rates. Um, asset prices, uh, since uh, quantitative easing started being anticipated, overall have been supportive. One can see that sovereign yields are now much lower than at the time, than August 2014, where the first anticipations of quantitative easing were evident. Uh, bank lending rates have come down as well. The euro has depreciated and equity markets have increased less than it used to be the case a few months ago because there's been a correction. But overall, you can see that not just through the credit channel, but also through the asset price channel, all of this is supporting aggregate demand, and this has a lot to do with quantitative easing. Last thing, non-performing loans. Uh, yesterday, you had a presentation here by some of my uh, colleagues. Uh, we have been working a lot on the issue of uh, the banks in Europe, and banks are now well capitalized, but there is an issue, which is that they still have a lot of non-performing loans, nearly a trillion uh, euros of non-performing loans in the balance sheet of banks. And this is something which is costly in terms of profitability, in terms of uh, credit, but we worry about credit and profitability insofar as it is the source of future capital and that can be used to provide further loans. And this uh, panel uh, tells you uh, how much uh, or how big are non-performing loans in the core countries and in other countries. And we have made an analytical exercise, which is um, looking at the non-performing loans in Europe and asking the questions, if you were to put in place the policies at the national level and at the supervisory level to provide more incentives for the uh, disposal of these non-performing loans and reduce the foreclosure time, how much more credit capacity will the European banks get? And it turns out that it's about 600 billion euros on, in new lending capacity or about 3% of loans, of new loans that could be created. So I think that this is something which is worth uh, doing. And this is the first three I'm going to talk about. I'll talk about some other threes. This is the 3% of new loans that could be obtained uh, in terms of loan capacity quite easily if some of these uh, policies that my colleagues discussed yesterday are put in place and which are not procyclical at all. They are legal reforms that help develop uh, uh, markets for non-performing loans and provide incentives for banks to put them on the market. So this is what I want to say about the legacies for the advanced economies. Now let me turn to the emerging markets, which is where the risks, financial risks, are uh, concentrating now. And let me start with the positives, which is that emerging markets are not where they were before the Asian crisis at all, in the sense that many more countries have adopted floating exchange rate regimes, which I think, and many of us think at the fund, are an important uh, line of defense to counter shocks, both external and internal, uh, that lead to relative price adjustments, um, there has been an increase in foreign exchange reserves, not just of China, but also of other emerging markets. Here you have them as a, a fraction of GDP. But as or even more important, there has been uh, a significant improvement in macroeconomic policy frameworks, in terms of monetary policy frameworks, fiscal policy frameworks, and much healthier financial sectors. So all of these things make emerging markets be a lot more resilient now than they were a number of years back. But one needs to acknowledge that emerging markets in the last few years have been traveling along the uh, uh, credit cycle. And what you have there is a graphical representation of where advanced economies are in the credit cycle, defined as a process where there is a repair of balance sheets, credit expansion, credit continue to expand even more, and then at one point, credit starts to moderate and non-performing loans start to increase. And advanced economies are in the upper half and emerging markets are in the lower half. In fact, many emerging markets are now moving from the peak of the credit cycle where credit 
was still increasing before, but non-performing loans were low, to a situation where credit is now starting to moderate and non-performing loans are starting to appear. And this is a constant in any historical process of fast uh, growth of credit. Credit growth first, and with a lack, non-performing loans later. This slide also makes the important point that there has been a lot of credit being created in emerging markets, and in many cases there are credit excesses defined by traditional measures like a credit gap, credit to GDP over trend credit to GDP, and, and you know, this is a rough uh, measure, but it's used to calibrate, for example, in Basel III, their countercyclical capital buffer, and this credit gap measure is being shown empirically to be one of the best predictors of future uh, problems regarding financial stability. So there is a significant degree of overborrowing, which amounts to $3 trillion in the group of emerging markets which are in that picture. And as I mentioned before, non-performing loans are increasing and they're likely to increase further. And again, you can see the difference between advanced economies and emerging markets. The question in the future is how fast are emerging markets uh, non-performing loans in banks? Uh, how fast is this process uh, going to be? And what is the capacity of the authorities to handle this without getting into deep trouble? Let me just say a word about one key emerging market, and we could talk about others, Brazil and Turkey, et cetera. Let me just focus on China. And China, is facing a very complex, complicated transition on different fronts, which needs to be navigated successfully because that's key for China and the world. The first has to do with navigating the rebalancing of China without causing a major fall in growth. And you can see that according, this is not the IMF forecast, these are the market forecasts, this is the consensus forecast, and according to the latest forecast, you can see that markets have become a little bit uh, more cautious about uh, Chinese growth uh, for 2016. But again, they do not forecast a precipitous fall. They forecast a, uh, a slowdown. And in fact, the fund is forecasting 6.3 next year, so we will be slightly below the median. So a little bit less sanguine about uh, Chinese growth than a few months uh, uh, before in terms of market forecast, but still betting that China can go with a slowdown and not a fall. And that's something that is very important for China. Second challenge is to deal with the corporate uh, vulnerabilities and, and with the banks. Now, in China, the increase in uh, credit has been phenomenal. And uh, it had led to nearly, of the 3.3 3, 3 trillion of credit excesses, about 2.5 are due to China. And that has led to a tremendous indebtedness of the corporates. The corporates who now have their debt at risk in terms of being the corporates with a relatively low capacity to continue servicing the debt is about 20, 25% of the corporate debt. That's very high. The non-performing loans on the banks are still very low, close to zero, 1.5%. They will go up. And China needs to manage this process where a number of corporates will have to default, a number of firms will have to exit because they are not viable, and you will have bankruptcies, and you will also have some banks uh, which will have issues to be dealt with. So it's very important that the Chinese exert vigilance and worry about bank asset quality going forward. And the last challenge that China is facing is to achieve all this at the same time as they move towards a more market-based financial system. And we have seen, for example, this summer when they made a change in the foreign exchange rate regime, which was supposed to lead to more market flexibility, well, they intervened a lot because they worried about the depreciation of the, uh, of the, um, of the uh, uh, currency. And therefore, at the end, this tension between moving towards market forces and then being afraid of what market forces do to you, this needs to be resolved. So we hope that going forward, uh, this thing will be managed more smoothly. It was not in the stock market, pro in the stock market, when the stock market got corrected. It was a healthy correction. It was not when the foreign exchange uh, regime was adjusted. So we hope that there is a learning by doing process here 
which will lead to better outcomes in the future, including through the clear communication of policies. China now plays in the big league of nations, and it needs to have policies which are as consistent and as clearly communicated as can be expected once you play in that big league. But let me talk about other emerging markets. I talk about Chinese corporates, leverage being an issue. How about other corporates in emerging markets? And this is an aggregate. I could disaggregate by different areas. The picture would not be very different. The key thing here is that in the last few years, after the crisis, the leverage in emerging market corporates has been going up notably at the same time as profitability has been coming down. And the issuing conditions uh, signaled by the, or, or reflected in the spreads, have been improving markedly, and that's in principle a suggestion that risks are smaller, while the debt servicing capacity of these corporates have become weaker and weaker. So in a way there is a contradiction between uh, the evolution of corporate fundamentals and their success in leveraging and also in uh, issuing at better terms. And the explanation is, of course, the fact that uh, liquidity conditions worldwide were very ample, very, uh, very easy, and this together with the high uh, price of commodities uh, is what explains why uh, there is this apparent contradiction. In fact, we have an empirical analysis which looks at the econometric determinants of this uh, leverage and uh, uh, spreads, and it turns out that global factors rather than domestic and firm level uh, factors, fundamentals, were uh, responsible for this. Now, what this says is that now that commodity prices are low, and now that interest rates are expected to tighten when the Fed tightens, and maybe their currencies depreciate further, the future environment for these corporates is not going to be as um, favorable as in the past, so they need to prepare for a more complicated environment. Why is it important, the health of the corporates? Because there may be a corporate bank nexus emerging in, a, in emerging markets if there are issues with the corporates. And as you can see there, em, banks are important for the corporates because they supply nearly 60% of the funding for their domestic corporates, domestic banks. And also, corporates are important for banks because on average, half of the loan book of banks belongs to the domestic corporates. So there is a clear corporate bank nexus there that needs to be managed uh, by avoiding uh, problems down the road. But that's not the only nexus which is critical in emerging markets. There is also a potential corporate sovereign nexus. And all of these things we have talked about in the European case, well, they are appearing now in the uh, emerging markets case. You can see that um, commodity producers in particular have been the biggest issuers of debt and the ones that have gotten more loans. So they have accumulated a lot of debt. And uh, one can see that on average, 30% of the debt of, uh, of commodity producing uh, countries is debt coming from commodity producing firms in terms of corporates, okay? A lot of this debt is also in foreign exchange and there is no way of knowing how much of this is hedged or not. There is no good information. So this is a little bit of a blind spot that needs to be sorted out because it gives us uh, some uh, uncertainty about what may happen if there are wild gyrations in exchange rates. But very importantly too, some of this debt has been accumulated by state-owned firms. And these state-owned firms uh, are the potential, if they were to get into trouble because they are in the commodity producing sector, as you can see, all of these firms there whose debt is you know, from 5% to GDP up to uh, nearly uh, uh, more than 20% of GDP. All of these, or most of them are in the commodity producing sector. They're state-owned firms, and therefore they are a source of contingent liabilities for the sovereign. And that's the corporate sovereign nexus. And that's very important because if any of those firms were to get into trouble in this, con in this context of low commodity prices, that would be putting pressure on the ratings, and that would put pressure on the capacity of the corporates to finance themselves. And already you can see, by looking at that graph, that there are a number of countries, like Brazil, Turkey, uh, where markets 
are pricing in spreads which are consistent with ratings which are poorer than the ones they have nowadays. So that's something to be watched. Now let me turn, after having talked about advanced economies and emerging market issues, about the last bit of the uh, uh, triad of challenges, financial market facilities. And I'll just go very fast through here because this has to do with potential amplifiers of volatility, which, are market Ill which is market illiquidity and leverage. I started talking about market potential risks of market liquidity two years ago, and nobody registered. Now this has become a very central part of the conversation, and for, for good reasons. And in fact, one can see this is just one reason why liquidity has become uh, less uh, resilient in, in, in the last few years, is the fact that there is less uh, dealer market making activity in, in markets, in financial markets. Also, if you have lower market making, if you have lower market depth, lower liquidity, volatility is likely to be exacerbated. And we are now in the middle, in the middle figure, in the, in the sort of uh, brown points, where if we move further west, we will go to much higher volatility. And we want to avoid that because that will lead to a tremendous overshooting on the part of markets, so be careful. Another potential amplifier of volatility has to do with leverage. And this is a very interesting uh, discovery of the uh, Global Financial Stability Report, that there is more leverage in the non-bank sector than we acknowledge. And by looking just as a sample of uh, plain vanilla investment funds, which are about $600 billion dollars, uh, uh, what we have found is that they have about $1.5 trillion in derivatives exposures, even after netting out hedging. So that's three times more exposure if you take everything than the assets under management. So you have about $2 trillion of exposure in that sample while you thought you only had $0.6 trillion. So a multiplier of three. Again, there is hidden leverage. We are not very well aware of it. This is something that needs to be investigated in the non-bank sector. So let me put uh, all of these things together, and I'm going to move to this, which are three scenarios for financial stability, which are clearly delineated in the report. We start from a baseline scenario where risk premium are compressed still, um, and where financial stability is not assured. And that's where I started. And we have two scenarios going forward. The good one, which is one where these compressed spreads across many markets get decompressed in a gradual manner in the context of better economic prospects, in the context of a normalization, successful normalization of monetary and financial conditions, and you go to a better place in terms of global output relative to the baseline. And if, you, if that happens, then you have nearly half percentage point of higher output by 2017 than in the baseline that we have in the wheel. But there is another, another scenario, which is not at all a tail risk scenario. This is a plausible but adverse scenario where there is an abrupt decompression in the spreads, which leads to disruptive shifts in asset markets. This would be in the context of something failing and what fails there is global confidence because of a shock in either advanced economies, emerging markets, or both. And that's something which leads to a decrease in output relative to the baseline of nearly two and a half percentage points by 2017. So the difference between being in the negative scenario and the positive scenario is nearly 3% of global GDP by 2017. And I use this device to make the point that it's very important that policies take us to the good scenario and avoid the bad scenario, which is not a tail risk. Tail risk would be much worse because there is 3% of global GDP on the table, which we should not uh, lose. Now, what is the policy uh, upgrade that would be necessary to deliver that? And uh, here is... Here are the uh, buzzwords, but this is what it entails. For advanced economies, 
Again, monetary policy needs to continue doing its job differently in the Euro area and in Japan than in the United States. There are different challenges, different cyclical positions. Uh, monetary policy needs to do the things which are there. But monetary policy is not enough. There are many structural policies, fiscal policies, which need to be dealt with, which are outside of the financial domain. But let me concentrate on the financial side. In the euro area, make banks stronger by resolving non-performing loans, make corporates stronger by dealing with the corporate debt overhang, and make the architecture of the euro area stronger because, as we saw in the case of Greece, um, you know, uh, uh, even if push didn't come to show, but one needs to make sure that the architecture is as resilient as possible. And 90% has been done, but there is a 10% that still needs to be done. So that's the task for the advanced economies. In emerging markets, I think it's critical to preserve investment grade if you have it. And that requires strengthening the fundamentals so that you are not downgraded, because that would be a very complicated thing to do. For example, in the case of Brazil, um, there are two companies which have downgraded. There is one which still keeps the, uh, uh, no, two downgraded, one is below investment grade, the other two are still above investment grade, critical for Brazil to maintain investment grade. And the same thing I would say for other key emerging markets. Second, get ahead of the credit cycle. I mentioned that these emerging markets were at the very late stages of the credit cycle where non-performing loans need, are going to increase. Question is, keep your corporates and keep your banks resilient through appropriate prudential policies. And in China, clear policy path towards a more market-based, stable financial system while the economy rebalances. And there, there are two ways. One is to wait to grow out of the problems and the other is move decisively. And I think that experience has shown that moving decisively will prove ultimately less costly than trying to grow out of the problem. Finally, at the global level, uh, in addition to using the policy buffers that countries have available if push comes to shove, I think it's very important to continue paying attention to uh, the resilience of financial markets, making sure that market liquidity is preserved once monetary normalization starts, and second, better oversight of non-banks, the so-called shadow banks, particularly the leverage, which is hidden, hidden or embedded through the leverage, uh, derivatives. And last but not least, continue to complete the regulatory reform and implement it, because that's part of the reason why uh, uh, the financial system would be, uh, would be uh, safer. So these are the main uh, policy propositions that we put forward in the report that we discussed with policymakers in Lima, and that, uh, let me stop here. Good, let, let me make a, a few remarks and then we'll open for Q&A. Yes, you can, you can sit there and I'll, I'll come in a minute. Um, Jose and I, when we were together at the farm, had uh, settled into a, a standard uh, routine, which is uh, the first draft of the GFSR would announce that the end of the world was around the corner. And uh, we all would say something like, well, stuff happened. Uh, and then the process of convergence uh, led to two documents which were actually uh, more or less uh, consistent, although smart readers of the two documents could still see uh, some, some wedge uh, between uh, Jose's views, which were slightly more negative, uh, and mine. Uh, I think it's very much in the nature of the beast, which is the, the we always about the baseline, fundamentally, with some risks, but baseline, and GFSR is very much about the risks. So I think intrinsically, uh, it, it is normal that uh, Jose would uh, worry more about the world than, uh, than I would uh, with, my, with my hat. I think the interesting thing this time is that, in fact, there was, uh, without an explicit process, near convergence, which is that actually this GFSR in the presentation that Jose gave uh, does not announce the end, the end of the world. You know, he has this uh, graph in which he has notches 
And uh, the last notch, if I read the graph correctly, is at the same level as in uh, April. So things basically are the same, the same degree of risk, no more, no less. And my sense is, if anything, the risks are a bit lower than they were in April, but not much. So I think in terms of uh, convergence, it's there. My, my view of, of the world, uh, looking, looking forward at this point, is that the baseline uh, is the news. The baseline is mediocre. Uh, and is likely to remain so for some time. But in terms of risks, I don't have a sense that we have entered a period of much higher risk. So in, in that sense, I, I share with, uh, I share the basic conclusion with Jose. If, if I think about the risks that people have mentioned on, on the macro side, uh, you know, the big discussion this summer and uh, tailing in, Re in Lima was China, and I think we, uh, have become, at least I've become convinced that the risk of a major uh, decrease in growth in the short term in China is very, very small. Uh, of the risk that have excited uh, people are clearly the, the lift, uh, risk associated with liftoff. And my sense here is that it's overplayed. It's extremely important for people who have positions, short positions, and need to know exactly which, what's going to happen. But from a macro point of view, I just don't see uh, 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 the risk that it becomes a major macro issue. I suspect we'll see bumps, but I don't see this as uh, turning into big differences in, in macro numbers. The thing which worries me, and Jose actually mentioned it, is the possibility of a sharp decompression of a premium. I mean, at this stage, a lot of the yield curve is a low premium as opposed uh, low expected rates, but the low premium is clearly a large part of the story. And I think central banks have a fairly good understanding of how moving interest rates of directly or through forward guidance moves the yield curve. But what exactly determines uh, the uh, premium uh, at the long end, I think, is much more mysterious. So it could be, I'm not sure, uh, it could be that when liftoff comes, uh, there is a change in perceptions. Uh, premium increases a lot, forces a turnaround in monetary policy to try to decrease the rate again. I, I suspect that we could see, uh, some, again, some, some bumps in financial markets. Whether they turn to be macro relevant or not, I don't know, but I worry a bit about it. What Jose did not mention, and I would not mention, but is mentioned by others, is the type of... Uh, large increase in excess risk-taking that the BIS uh, is uh, complaining around uh, uh, about. I think we, we have looked, uh, Jose has uh, indicated that there are pockets where clearly this might be an issue, but in general, I don't think that we see this as, as a major source of risk. Um, one of the big themes that Jose put on, I think on the first slide or second slide, is the rotation <coughs> of, let me just drink something. <coughs> is the rotation from uh, advanced economies to emerging markets. I think that's very right. Um, and here, I think there are some numbers which are not scary, but are, we, we should keep in mind. And, and, and Jose has shown this, and it's explained, it's presented at, um, in more detail in the GFSI itself, which is that where we see, we see large increases in debt in those sectors uh, which are the most likely to be affected by an adverse shock, namely commodity uh, producers, with it, whether it's uh, corporations or it's, uh, it's country states. Um, the, this is where the debt has increased the most, and I think one of my worries about the baseline is that emerging market growth, which has slowed down, could slow down more. And this would have an effect on them, an effect on commodity prices, and I think that loop we really have to think about. Let me just finish with by making, uh, I don't know if it's a controversial proposition, but uh, uh, some reaction to the last part of the presentation by Jose and, and the reaction to chapter two of the GFSR which is uh, market liquidity and the decrease in market liquidity. 
And I'm going to do this with my hat as, as a macroeconomist, not, not a finance person caring about what happens in markets per se. And uh, I think the, the big question is, should we care very much from a macro point of view about market liquidity? And I'm specific about market liquidity. There are other dimensions which are clearly relevant. Now, again, as explained in the chapter, Jose didn't have the time to do it, you can think of, of, of two issues. The first one is in steady state. The market is less liquid because there are less buyers ready to do it. They take a while to come. So this means that you're, if you're a seller, uh, it takes a bit longer. It's a bit more risky. You don't know what price. Well, this is not an enormous issue. I mean, you're going to basically require a slightly higher rate of return for holding the assets that are hard to dispose of. So this is going to lead to a slightly larger premium at the macro level, unless you're at the zero lower bound, you can offset this by a lower policy rate. It's not the end of the world. My sense is that that's an issue which is very important for people in those markets, but not very important for somebody like me in my previous uh, job. The issue is, uh, is when is, is uh, not steady state, but liquidity freezes. Uh, times where the, the sellers want to sell and the buyers are there, but they're not there yet. Uh, for some reason, they, can't, they just don't have inventory, it takes time, and so on, and so on. And so you get very large adjustments. And here, I think we have to distinguish between two things. And even in the discussion of a chapter, I thought that they, they might have been mixed. Uh, one phenomenon, which is not market liquidity, is kind of uh, sudden stops. All the sellers want to sell, and there is no buyer. Well, this is not a market liquidity issue. This is a case of the market just having more sellers than buyers and the price has to adjust, and it's due to, it, it's an issue, but it's not a market liquidity issue. A market liquidity issue is a case in which the sellers want to sell for good reasons, and the buyers are not ready or not able to basically satisfy the sellers right away, so you get overshooting of the price uh, in the direction that the sellers are selling, so downwards in this case. That's what market liquidity uh, crisis uh, are about. And I think by their very nature, they're transient. And if there are no buyers, it's a different thing. If the buyers never come, it's because there were no buyers. If the buyers come, it's likely that they come within a day, they come within a week. And it seems to me that to get from a scenario like this and some of the episodes we have seen, you know, five million crazy stuff happening uh, to ma big macro implications um, is a very large step. So I, I, I tend to think of market liquidity as a really important issue for finance, but probably not such a big issue from the point of view of, uh, of the world economy. So I'm going to stop there, and uh, from now on, questions to Jose. Unless you want to say something first. Actually, the same question, now can we slide over? So the door is the microphone there. Thank you. Let's put it somewhere. wants to start. Okay. Uh, Joe Bolio from Brevin Howard, and my question is very simple. Can you respond to Olivier's point at the end on liquidity? Because in thinking about it, it seems to me, and just asking my question would be like, what am I missing? is that in an environment where you can't sell corporate bonds as easily, if there are idiosyncratic shocks, well, that could be a real problem for you, but by definition, it's not a macro issue. And if we're worried about liquidity in a much more broader environment, it didn't seem to me that a bigger balance sheet by broker-dealers, for instance, would be able to uh, absorb that anyway, and that they would just, it's such an event, would just be run over. Each one. Okay, let me let me answer answer to that. Um, I think that the issue of liquidity, of market illiquidity, or the risk of market illiquidity, is important not because it may pertain to a particular market, but because it may encompass a broader group of markets. In fact, um, even markets as liquid as U.S. Treasuries or as uh, the Bunds market in Europe 
have had particular episodes of market illiquidity. But what I'm really more concerned, and not just me, if you look at the world program of the Financial Stability Board, has put the risk of market illiquidity very much at the center of the world program. And why is that? Because there may be situations where you have the equivalence of runs on markets. And that's something which in the banking system we worry about. And over time, we have developed deposit guarantee schemes, not because we are afraid of a particular run in a particular bank, but also because there may be systemic implications, and we want to deal with that. And one thing which is not well uh, addressed at present is the fact that there has been a lot of money uh, that searching for yield has gone into the non-bank sector, has gone into many mutual funds. Um, people there have some sort of liquidity illusion in the sense that they think that the investments that they had are more, more, much more liquid than what they are. And when people search for yield, they buy higher return assets, which are also high risk, including liquidity risk. And the question is, what would happen if you are in a situation where you have some fear when people scream fire and everybody in the theater tries to exit at a time where the exit door has become smaller than in the past. Then what you have is a market collapse. We saw that in the crisis in the case of Lehman. We did it. We saw it. We saw fire sales. And we saw that liquidity evaporated very suddenly. Why? Because there was a lot of leverage and people were caught wrong-footed and they had to sell. And when everybody sells and nobody buys, then liquidity evaporates. Here, the issue of, uh, that I'm talking about uh, is one that can lead to leverage-like behavior in terms of consequences without leverage. And if on top of that, you have some pockets of hidden leverage in the non-bank sector, you know, outside of hedge funds and so on, which we know are leverage, then this is something which can add to volatility. This is something that worries us. This is something that we think has the potential to be macrocritical at times, but at times which matter a lot. And this is why we have been calling uh, from the fund, but the FSB also is calling for a better oversight of liquidity in the non-bank sector, in the asset management industry, and for making market liquidity more resilient. Because we know that the level of liquidity is high, but we have serious doubts about how resilient is market liquidity when you have some shocks. And there are two factors that may compromise this liquidity. And one of them is a very sudden and, rapid and, and, and big shift in global risk aversion. And that's something that may happen quickly. So prevention, always better than cure. This is why we highlight this as a potential risk and something that if one puts in place the right policy framework, you very much minimize the risk of this thing happening. <clears throat> Let me just add up something. I, the analogy with what happened in 2008, I think, is misleading. If suddenly in the market you have a large increase in uncertainty about the quality of your underlying asset, then there's going to be no trade, and the market is going to become illiquid. But the problem is not the usual part of market liquidity. The issue is that what was traded becomes impossible to price, and in which case you clearly have problems. So I think that. If I see the problems of market liquidity, which I see today, which is the broker dealers playing a smaller role, this is a very different story from what happened in 2008. I mean, it's not just broker dealers. There are many other dimensions of liquidity. And in Lehman, it was that people didn't know what the assets were worth. But you may have a situation where people get scared about emerging markets, and they try to sell. And then when people sell, they sell because they think that things are worth less than what they thought they were worth. And then you have fire sales. And at the end, the consequences are not very different, regardless of whether you have one cause or the other. That, I think, is something which is relevant. But uh, Morris. Uh, Morris Goldstein uh, Peterson. I wanted to ask Jose about some of the interesting uh, charts that he has on performing loans in, in Europe. And we saw this also in the interesting report that his colleagues uh, presented a day or two uh, ago. <clears throat> I think uh, in that report they mentioned that NPLs in EU banks and U.S. banks were roughly equal, but write-downs were half as big in Europe as uh, in the U.S. So my question is the following. 
let's suppose that NPL recognition, loan loss provisioning, and write downs were the same procedures essentially in EU banks as in US banks. Uh, what difference does that make to the sort of aggregate capital ratio? Are we talking about a half a percent? Uh, it, it, in other words, it's overstated by a half a percent? Or are we saying it's overstated by 2%? Or tr try and give me, a, 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 at least uh, may not have done this calculation, but you could. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what's the, the magnitude uh, of, uh, of these sort of shenanigans that are going on, uh, uh, in a sense, in EU banks? Right, right. Um, we haven't done that specific calculation, but uh, you, you point to a very important fundamental uh, reason why uh, the US and Europe show different levels of non-performing loans. In the US, the authorities have been very active in making banks provision, write, write down, write off these loans. And this aggressive attitude has been very important. I mean, non-performing loans is something which consumes regulatory capital. I think it's well beyond one or two percentage points. Well, well beyond one percentage points, maybe two percentage points of more in terms of, uh, of risk-weighted assets. Um, it is something which uh, traps the balance sheet of banks and therefore uh, doesn't make this part of the balance sheet uh, generate profits, which can be used to generate capital, and therefore that's something that is needed to provide further loans. And it's something which is very costly as well to run and, and you know, distracts you and so on. So I think that tackling ad aggressively non-performing loans in key <laughs> is key. When the ECB, the SSM, carried out the comprehensive assessment uh, last year, to me, one of the big discoveries was that the amount of non-performing loans in the euro area had jumped by 18%. The non-performing exposures, as they call it, had jumped by 18% to nearly 800 billion euros. A year after, they became 900 billion euros. And you know, we started talking to the ECB, and we were on the same page, that this was very important to address. The exercise that we do, at the, in the report is a simple one saying, what would be the impact if you were to reduce the foreclosure time from two and a half years to one year in the core countries and in the periphery countries, that would provide a lot more incentives for banks to sell their non-performing loans and for investors to buy the non-performing loans because this is an asset now which has higher value. And this is something which would be extremely useful. Now, in order to do that, you need supervisory, you need changes in legal frameworks at the national level, and you need pressure on the part of the supervisor, of the single supervisor. This pressure has not been there in the past. And now, with the centralized supervision by the SSM, this pressure is being felt. So I think that moving to the single supervisor has enhanced also the quality of supervision, and I am hopeful that in Europe, the same type of pressures will be happening as in the United States. They're already happening, but what needs further development are the, is the, the legal structures which are needed for a market for non-performing loans to uh, be developed. That needs to be done by the national uh, authorities, but the supervisor can play a big role, and the good news is that it's starting playing this role. Uh, uh, Nick Lardy, Peterson. Uh, at the outset, uh, you had a slide showing the big sell-off in Chinese equities over the summer as a piece of evidence that you know financial risk is rising in emerging markets. Later on in your remarks, you said that the correction it was a healthy correction of the Chinese stock market. I would have thought a healthy correction would reduce financial risks, not increase them. Yeah, what I meant is uh, risks in emerging markets are beginning to be priced in. I think that the correction in the stock exchange was a correction, and therefore it was healthy, and it should have, I would have let it run its course more than, than, than what happened. What I meant was that if you look at commodity prices after what happened in China, after the uncertainties about growth in China, commodity prices were affected, uh, exchange rates were affected in many emerging markets, those that had the bigger exchange rate depreciations were 
the emerging markets that had closer linkages with China, and therefore it was the Chinese growth uncertainty which led to this financial market impact. And that told you that now financial markets are much more sensitive to what happens in China than a few years back. Why? Because China now is recognized as much more important for everybody, particularly the emerging markets and the advanced economies, which have close uh, commercial links with China. So that was the point. Bill? I'm Bill Klein here at the Institute. The, the increasing concern about corporate debt and leverage, et cetera, strikes me a little bit like you know, th this question of whether the governments uh, of advanced economies are, are much more impoverished now because their debt to GDP has risen. But if you do those charts, then you look at the interest burden, and it hasn't budged. So I'm wondering to what extent the corporate is just a ma manifestation of the same phenomenon with, with lower baseline global interest rates. Uh, you can carry more nominal debt uh, than you used to. I just wonder if we're, if we're exaggerating that risk a bit. Now, on the credit, I was interested that you said two and a half out of the three trillion excess credit was in China. I mean, I've always thought that if, if you're talking about China, you're not talking about a bank risk or even an SOE risk because the government's got a lot of fiscal capacity and can sure. step in as a backstop. Sure. So that also suggests a little of a, of a downplaying of the of the severity. The one thing that does seem to me on the, under the real side that is a new phenomenon is the commodity prices. Uh, now, of course, that benefits commodity importers, mm -hmm. but for the commodity exporters, it, you see a quite clear co connection of the decline in their ex exchange rates, for example, with their commodity dependence. So what's your thinking about whether this is sort of permanent or, I mean, after all, it's triggered by oil. Uh, not too long ago, we thought oil was going to come back up fairly quickly, so I'd like to hear a little bit more of your views on the, the real side on commodities and how long this is, this is likely to last. Okay. Let me, let me just um, answer to the various points that you made, which uh, I, I think that they're also important. Um, on the corporates in emerging markets, it is true that interest rates are very low, and this is something which is very helpful regarding their capacity to service their debt. Now, a lot of this debt is uh, in foreign currency. Um, you know, that's likely to um, be affected if it's not perfectly hedged. And this is longer term debt. So over time, you cannot hedge uh, such long term positions. Uh, so that's going to increase the debt servicing uh, in local currency of these, uh, of these firms. Many of these firms have natural hedges in terms of commodity prices. So if commodity prices come down on a rather uh, uh, durable manner, uh, these natural hedges also disappear. And even if all the debt is taken in domestic currency, we're taking in domestic currency, the fact that interest rates in the United States will increase in the future, that's normally going to lead to higher interest rates in this economy. So I think that that's going to make life a little bit more complicated for them. But even without that, what one sees is that the debt servicing capacity of these emerging market corporates has deteriorated in the last few years. Debt servicing capacity measured, for instance, by a statistic like profits over total debt service. This is something which has come down. I was making the point in China. In China, 25% of the corporate debt is owned by firms where the debt, where the profit to debt service ratio is very low. Now, it is true that if many of these corporates are state owned enterprises, these corporates owe the money to domestic banks. So if there is a problem, yes, the Chinese authorities, Chinese government has significant buffers to go and offset that. But they would be spending those buffers there and no longer on something else which may be useful in the future. And also, China is a country that doesn't have now uh, good resolution frameworks for corporate uh, debt workouts. It doesn't have good resolution frameworks for um, bank resolution. All of these things need to be put in place in order to make this process more manageable. And there is no doubt that in the future, there will be some defaults in China. We've already seen a few of them, one of them uh, yesterday, but some defaults in China, some bankruptcies, 
and some exits of, of firms which are not viable. And China needs a framework for that. So it is, it is important to, make, to, to realize that the debt servicing capacity of emerging market corporates has, not, has been coming down. And in the future, with gross prospects coming lower, with commodity prices remaining low, and interest rates going up, this is something which is going to make the matter more complicated. Now, your, your final question about the future evolution of commodity prices, uh, that's something on which I have no particular expertise. Um, in the fund, uh, we have looked always at futures, and futures have been uh, very wrong predicting commodity prices. Um, there are factors which have to do with new technology, as we know, which have to do with decisions on the part of OPEC. But my impression, personal impression, is that the low commodity prices uh, are closer to a new normal in commodity prices than the old situation where we had much higher commodity prices. But that's a personal judgment. I uh, do not pretend to be the ultimate expert on, the, uh, on commodity prices. But I think it's going to be much lower than what it used to be the case in the past. So the commodity super cycle, as we've known it, I think it's finished. Let, let me just, I was looking for numbers in the GFSR on the interest coverage ratio, which talks to your point, because it takes into account the fact that the interest is low. And so in 2007, uh, I think the set of countries must be the emerging markets. The share of firms with an ICR of less than two uh, was about 20%, and it's now 35%. So even under the existing conditions, it clearly is even worse than if you were to increase the interest rate along the lines that Jose get said, this could, this could start being a serious number. This is in the GFSR. Uh, yes. I am Arturo Porsekensky <coughs> with American University. Uh, when I talked to my former colleagues on Wall Street uh, about uh, risks having moved to the, shadow, to the shadow banking system and about liquidity measured in various ways having diminished uh, in several markets, they go like, does that surprise you? That was actually the intent of the regulatory onslaught. Are you willing to connect the dots? Regulatory onslaught? That's what your friends say, not what you say. <laughs> I mean, let, let, let me say something about uh, regulation. Um, I think that the regulatory efforts that have been put in place in the last few years um, have made the core of the financial system safer. And they have made the banking system much safer. So I think that this is very important. Now, of course, from the viewpoint of Wall Street, any regulation. I mean, if Wall Street had its own way, do you think would be some changes in Dodd-Frank? Of course, yes. Do you think would be some changes, there would be some changes in the global regulatory reforms that have been put in place by the Financial Stability Board and have been approved by the G20 and so on? Of course. Now, I think that the issue of market making is just one out of many reasons and the impact of regulation on market making is one out of many reasons why market making has declined. And market making is one among other reasons why market liquidity is less resilient. There is another thing, which is high frequency trading. If you look at the US report on why the flash crash or flash rally, depending on how you interpret, of October 15, they come up with a lot of uh, 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 questions, uh, more than answers, but some of the answers have to do with the role of high frequency trading. And yesterday there was a speech of Mary Jo White from the SEC, which said we need to do a better job in overseeing a high frequency trading. So I think that the market liquidity is multifaceted. Regulation is not the main reason. And look, regulation has made overall the financial system safer. And you need to prove that lower market resilience has to do just with regulation. We look at that in the specific chapter that we have uh, done for this uh, Global Financial Stability Report. And regulation is one out of many reasons why market liquidity is now less resilient 
done uh, in the past. The main thing about regulation is made overall the financial system safer by making the core of the financial system, which is the banking system, safer. And now there are regulatory plans uh, in motion in order to address the issue of the risks of low resilience of market liquidity. So that's also in the pipeline. So you can go back to your Wall Street friends and Shadow banking is there, and the role of regulation is to transform shadow banking, which means things which are like banks, which do the same thing as banks in terms of leverage, in terms of maturity or liquidity transformations, they need to be regulated properly. And that's something which is in the pipeline. But this is being worked out at the global level, and hopefully it will be put in place in the future. And what you want is to move from shadow banking to stable sources of uh, finance through markets, which, as we know, is very important. It is something that other areas, for example, Europe, is lacking and they're trying to develop. So we need to move from the shadows to the light. Uh, Tom Glessner from uh, Gavi Investments. Um, you know, I think that this report, in uh, three or four years, people will look back on it and they will reflect on the fact that uh, you saw some things that will become more evident. That's one just comment I have. My question really is, is back to China. Um, and, you know, what I've found is that not only are there issues with regard to resolution of companies and resolution of banks, but even for asset disposition, given where the credit cycle is, that I see many problems. I have never seen, you know, asset management companies, and having visited some of them, it's kind of unique, um, you know, borrowing and making loans. Uh, let me just put it this way. I think there's an international standard for how we should think about how these institutions should function. Um, now that, as one of you put it, uh, the Chinese are with the big boys. Uh, I don't know which one. Uh, I, think, I think it's an interesting question. You know, how does the political economy work of getting an improvement in the quality of information and in the institutions in China? I would just be very interested in both your thoughts on that topic. I mean, you, you started giving the example of um, some of the things that are going on in the Chinese sort of non-bank sector or shadow banking sector, if you want to put it that way. And I think the issue of institutional quality is key in the, in the, in the case of China in many dimensions. Um, I think that the good thing and this is something that was apparent in Lima, and you were there, and you uh, heard also some of the statements that were made by the Chinese officials present, which were very articulated, and I think that they succeeded in uh, transmitting confidence uh, to the people that gathered around uh, the meetings that the Chinese understood what the challenges are, understood the complications of rebalancing the economy, trying to achieve orderly the leveraging of the corporate sector and at the same time moving towards a more market-based financial system. And the technical people understand that. Uh, what is very important is also that, uh, you know, other parts of the Chinese decision-making uh, process, let me call it that way, are in sync with this and are able to take the right measures at the right time. But I think that uh, institutional quality, policy consistency, and clear communication are things that the world is going to demand from China going forward. And China needs to provide it because as I was saying before, China now plays in the big league and they need to behave according to the standards which are demanded uh, of countries whose movements or communications have global, uh, global impact. Can, can you say just a word of the role of the uh, Chinese FSAP in that context? Well, the Chinese FSAP, um, as you know, the FSAP is the Financial Sector Assessment Program, which is a program that was started 15 years ago. We do it uh, regularly in, uh, in, in, in our members who demand it every five years in the systemically important financial systems. China is one of them. So we did one in 2011. Now we are starting the other one. There is now a mission in China precisely to discuss the terms of the FSAP. And uh, we uh, hope to know more about uh, all of these issues uh, and to help 
China um, in the process of thinking about how to move in two directions. One, how to increase uh, market-based mechanisms so that the financial system can develop, but at the same time, how to put in place the financial stability safeguards in order to continue or it's strengthening the stability of the financial system. And this is something which is going to be an engagement that will take more than a year, but that uh, together with the other actions that we're having in the fund in terms of collaborating uh, with China, hope that can be successful. But there are many, many, many fronts and many uh, different organizations which are now uh, collaborating with China. Uh, in my capacity at the fund that's responsible of the financial area, this is uh, one of the key things we will be doing uh, in the next uh, 12 months. Well, it's, it's time. So let me thank you. I mean, this is a, it's a very impressive document, both I think in terms of uh, architecture as a theme, and maybe it will turn out to be prescient, it may well. Uh, there's also, and uh, now that I'm outside the front, I realize the wealth of information which is provided uh, in these documents and for which now as a customer, I'm extremely thankful and thankful. Thank you for coming. And thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier. Uh, it's, a pity, it's a pity that you left at the time that we were converging. And uh, we still have, converge, have to converge on one issue, on that on market liquidity. This is, by the way, an extremely controversial issue. And you can see views coming from everywhere. So there are two camps. It matters a lot. It doesn't. Uh, and I think that this is going to be part of the global debate. And I hope that we can continue discussing this and other issues in the future. So thanks very much to everybody. Thanks.